Chapter 14, Voice of Paradise. Corrin is filled with doubt after witnessing brutality in Shev. Seeking answers, he agrees to meet with King Garen at the Circensia Theater in Nestra. <laughs> yes. Brother. Oh. No. Um. <clears throat> Let me explain. Understood. Well...
legacy of lies, a familiar disguise. Sing with me a song of conquest and fate. The black <laughs> Awesome. My apologies. Yeah. In the rewrite, Korn is a little bit less stupid about that singer's true identity. In a normal playthrough, Chapter 14 is a very exciting time. We've just unlocked the Tier 2 shops, and that usually means we get a massive power spike. For us, on this run, it doesn't quite work like that, for reasons we'll get into shortly. The boss of this mission is Kumagera, the only named Oni Chieftain in the whole game. He's packing counter magic to ward off mages, plus a darting blow and certain blow to hit hard on his own phase, and he carries both a mace and an ox spirit. Kumagera is a pretty cool guy because you can capture him like Hitaka and he makes for a reliable mixed tank. If you're not interested in that, well, this is a defeat boss mission and he's standing right out in the open, so all you really have to do to win is to make Camilla fly over and kill him. Some of the archers and other generic enemies can try to interfere, but they're not that strong, and this map restricts infantry mainly to the maze of interconnected boats, so it's relatively easy for flyers to avoid them. The real challenge comes from the Shrine Maidens. The one by Hitaka has Entrapped, She's supposed to pull an unsuspecting victim into the range of Hitaka and his two archer companions. The maiden on the stage has a hexing rod, and she's also covered by a pair of archers who are meant to deter flyers from something going over and killing her. Three more shrine maidens on the boats carry Enfeeble or Freeze to disrupt your team further. The two treasures on this map are 10,000 gold and a seraph robe. One of the Shrine Maidens drops a chest key, but if you want both, you have to bring someone with Lock Touch. We were already forced to bring Niles to capture Hitaka, so that's not a problem. As soon as you cross the vertical line below the Seraph Robe chest, reinforcements in the form of paired up Sky Knights and Kenshi Knights will appear from the west side of the map. Those Kenshi Knights will be our first generic promoted enemies. Interestingly, that milestone occurs much earlier in Birthright and Revelation, even though those routes are supposed to be the easier ones. At the south edge of the map is a green unit named Keaton. He will walk toward Korn and try to talk with him, and after that conversation, Keaton will join the team. We'll take a closer look at him later. For now, all we need to know is we should put Korn in Keaton's range on turn 1 so that Keaton can recruit himself. If we leave him to his own devices, the nearby archers will eventually kill him. Now, I said earlier that this chapter is supposed to give us a big power spike. For us, it's probably going to be the low point of the run. That's because a whole bunch of different goals that we have are about to collide with each other in a very unfortunate way. 
For example, this is supposed to be the time when Elise picks up the bolt axe and starts destroying the enemies with it. However, we've benched her for three chapters, and now we want to give her a lot of experience, ideally reaching level 17. She could probably get there just by fighting Oni Savages and Sky Knights and then taking the boss kill at the end, but we have to give that boss kill to Niles, and therefore we need Elise to take on some much less appropriate targets. We'll have to rely on some rather inaccurate attacks, and although we've mitigated that as best we can using the Secret Book, a Skill Tonic, and a Luck Tonic, those are not sufficient to achieve actual reliability. We haven't even bought the Bolt Axe yet, because it turns out that physical weapons are going to work better for what Elise is actually going to do. We did buy the Leaven Sword, but we're willfully misusing it. Instead of giving it to Corrin, who desperately wants it, we have it on Laszlo, the man with zero magic. He uses the Leaven Sword to deal less damage on purpose, so that we can get more dual strikes. So Corrin and Elise are basically in the same boat. We're temporarily sabotaging them with subpar loadouts in the name of long-term growth. That's part of a larger strategic change I made for this run. On previous campaigns where I've tried this kind of challenge, I've chosen to do Paralogue 19, Percy's Paralogue, immediately after Chapter 13. But this time, I've pushed that back. The enemies in the Paralogue will scale up to higher levels, so they'll grant more experience, but in the meantime the team is a little weaker across the board, and we don't have as much money as we otherwise would. The good news is that we've just acquired a great new unit in our younger brother, Leah. To me, Leah was never really felt like a little brother. I think that's because he's pre-promoted. He just exudes competency, I guess, in both gameplay and story terms. Leo's personal tome is Brynhildr. Essentially, this is a souped-up thunder tome with 5 extra might and a higher crit chance. It also has a special effect. If it's in Leo's inventory, then he has a skill percent chance to have the damage from any magical attack, whether from a tome or scroll, or leaven sword, or whatever else you can think of. That bonus is not very important, but that's mainly because Leo has really good resistance in the first place. People often overrate the personal weapons of both Leo and Takumi. You do have to realize that you can get something functionally equivalent to Brynhildr just by forging a Thunder Tome or Fimble Feather enough. However, Brynhildr is totally free, and that's a big plus. In addition to his great resistance, Leo also has a fantastic magic stat, and the rest of his stats are pretty good too. He's maybe a little slow, but that's relatively easy to patch up. For example, a maid like Felicia can give him 3 speed and 2 magic out of the box, and more with higher support ranks. Later on, we can also acquire some special scrolls that can make Leo even faster, and we'll have some other speed boosting tools besides. Leo's personal skill, Pragmatic, makes him better against injured foes. That's nice, although it doesn't offer a lot of synergy with his default playstyle. What Leo normally tries to do is the typical Fire Emblem good unit tactic. That is, you give him enough speed to double the enemies, and then he one-rounds them from full health using his high-powered tome. Pragmatic doesn't really do anything there. It's much more effective with Nosferatu, but contrary to what the class name might suggest, Dark Knights cannot use Dark Magic. I've said before that Leo is about the fourth best mage in Conquest. I totally stand by that, but that in no way indicates that Leo is anything less than great. In fact, this map is sort of designed to highlight his power. When equipped with Brynhildr and factoring in Malefic Aura, Leo has 33 attack that hits resistance. Assuming he doesn't get enfeebled, that's enough to one-shot all of the archers, who have 27 HP and 6 res. It's also very nearly enough to kill the Oni Savages. Leo just needs 2 extra points of magic, which someone like Felicia can supply. Against the Samurai, Leo has enough speed to avoid getting doubled, and he can easily kill them if you give him a dual strike or if you boost his magic by 4. That's very good performance against every type of enemy other than the Sky Knights. One last note about Leo. His internal level is only 18, so he gains experience as if he were two levels lower than displayed. We need to rearrange our army. All of the ground units will travel across the boats, so they should go towards the southern end of our formation. The flying units can stay on the north side. Before we begin, we have a couple of class changes to execute. First is Laszlo, who takes the Master Seal from Chapter 13 to promote to Bow Knight. Laszlo loves everything he gets from this. Three extra speed, a mount, bows, and eventually another rally skill. Namely, rally skill.
Selena uses a friendship seal, having just achieved an a support with Baruka. She becomes our fourth Wyvern Rider. Compared to Baruka, she's less skillful and she has no axe rank, but she's much faster and stronger. You can sort of think of her as Camilla Jr. <laughs> now that Selena has become a flyer herself, our lineup makes a little more sense. Our first point of engagement will be with the samurai to the northeast. Perry will ride that way and drop Benny in front of the enemies, while Elise, Baruka, and Selena can all fly straight across to attack directly. Corin will head southeast with Laszlo to meet up with Keaton. Felicia, Odin, and Leo will follow Perry. This does mean we'll be fighting under the Hexing Rod on turn 1, but if we arrange our units correctly, we can trick the AI into using that on the wrong target. That's the kind of thing you have to do when you still aren't deploying your Songstress. We miss you, Azura. We miss you so much. Ready for this? I won't leave you. Ready to go. Our first battle looks like a pretty good idea. Elise attacks a samurai using the dual club, getting a 98% chance to hit. The issue is that on enemy phase, Elise faces not only the samurai, but also a couple of skynets. She wants the dual club for the former, but definitely not the latter. Because it doubles all weapon triangle effects, using the dual club with the wrong matchup is worse than doing the same with a regular axe. Therefore, when Baruka flies over after Elise's attack, she makes her equip the Steel Axe instead. Baruka then switches to Nyx, who finishes off the samurai that Elise just wounded. Kill them all. <laughs> we certainly don't want Elise to have to fight both remaining samurai. They have the pass skill, so if Elise deals lethal damage to them, then at least the closer of the two samurai can target someone else, either Odin or Perry. Using her Forged Steel Axe, Elise has 29 attack, minus 1 for weapon triangle disadvantage versus a B rank in swords. Against 8 defense, Elise deals 20 damage. For Elise's attack to be lethal, Nyx has to provide a dual strike worth 8 damage against 9 resistance. Therefore, we need Nyx to equip a tome that gives her 25 attack. Right now, with fire, she has 23. 22 displayed attack, plus 1 from Elise. Nyx does not have Malefic Aura equipped. If she did, she'd already be at the threshold. But we need to separate Baruka from her. That will take away 2 points of magic, so Nyx will have to equip a Thunder Tome instead. Without Malefic Aura, she needs the Forged One. Don't you dare lose! Let's go! This pair of Sky Knights can attack Niles from below, but Felicia can prevent that just by standing in their way. Flyers can go over the tiles at the front and back of each boat, but they can't stop on them, and that cuts down on the number of ways they're allowed to attack. Leo waits at a position where Corrin can join him. After that, the Shrine Maiden with the Hexing Rod targets Nyx, because Nyx is at least theoretically in range of several enemies, and her Staff Avoid is very bad. We need Elise and Nyx to hit both of these attacks. When I first came up with this setup, I had Odin next to Elise, and his accuracy is a lot better. But in that version, Nyx had already promoted to Dark Knight. Without that promotion, I needed Nyx to be closer to the front, so she and Odin swap places. Now the combat is less reliable, but Nyx does make fantastic Hexing Rod bait because she doesn't care about losing half her HP. She's terrible at tanking regardless. Don't die on me.
Hey! Yep. <sighs> Again? <laughs> I really don't care. I see. Yeah. I guess I'll save your tail. Well... I'm Keaton, your superior. Many Fire Emblem games have a character who transforms into some kind of dragon or beast. This game has two, Corrin being the first and Keaton being our second. As a wolf skin, Keaton uses beast stones to take on the form of, you guessed it, a wolf. Or some kind of werewolf thing. It's pretty weird, actually. We've seen stone mechanics before with Corrin. Keaton's weapons are similar. They provide an assortment of stat changes, with the beast stone granting a lot of speed and skill, and the beast rune improving his defenses. One key difference is that Dragonstones prevent their users from making follow-up attacks, but the Beast Stone and Beast Rune do not. If Keaton is fast enough, then he is allowed to double his opponents. By selecting either the Stone or the Rune, Keaton can switch between offensive and defensive modes at will, similar to the way that Korn had his choice of either the Yato or the Dragonstone. And aside from skill, Keaton has a fantastic stat line. Unfortunately, even though we will eventually acquire a stronger version of the Beast Stone, Beast units never get any ranged weapons. Unless he changes his class, Keaton will be eternally locked to melee combat. The stones can't be forged either. These are huge limitations on his potential as a combat unit. Depending on the conditions you play under, Keaton's personal skill might be one of the best in the game. When he completes his action on the first seven turns of a battle, Keaton has a luck percent chance to pick up any type of gem or cooking ingredient that is normally obtainable on your chosen route. That can be very useful if you don't have that particular item in your castle naturally. For this skill to trigger, Keaton himself has to take a turn-ending action. Attack, lunge, staff, shelter, separate, pair up, rally, wait, or a few other special actions. It doesn't count if he's paired up with someone else who does those things, nor if he gets transferred or dropped. Beastbane says it enables a unit in animal form to deal bonus damage to beasts. What that means is that when fighting horse, pegasus, bird, wolf, or fox units, the might of beast stones and beast runes is doubled. So for example, the 9 Might of Keaton's Beast Rune increases to 18 against the Sky Knights. Keaton's other skill, Odd Shaped, makes him deal 4 extra damage when the turn number is odd. That's a great effect that we'll gladly take, although honestly I'd rather have plus 2 all the time, even if that meant missing some thresholds that he could reach with plus 4. It would be easier to manage that way and harder to forget about. Earlier I briefly mentioned that when looking purely at his combat stats, Keaton's biggest flaw is his accuracy. It's especially bad with the Beast Rune, the weapon Keaton normally prefers on enemy phase. 96 hit doesn't cut it anymore. Even Elise reaches 105 with a Bronze Axe. Keaton's skill growth won't help him either. However, the Wolf Segner class that he promotes into not only gives him two more points of skill, but also comes with an innate 10 point hit bonus. That doesn't always give him perfect hit rates or anything, but it's a big help. The traditional way to use Keaton is not to worry about his combat abilities at all. Instead, you make him a pure para bot. Wolfskins provide 3 points of strength and speed, and those bonuses increase by 1 point each after promotion. Compared to Fighter and Berserker, 
That amounts to one less strength in exchange for one more speed, which is often a very good trade. In some cases, the ability to grant four speed instead of three after promotion gives Keaton an important edge over someone like Arthur. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but what I have learned while planning this run is that after he promotes and his accuracy gets fixed, Keaton becomes a pretty good dual striker too. He will have very good strength, and his hit rate with a B-stone is guaranteed to be at least 130. Stones aren't involved in the weapon triangle, so that's 130 against every kind of enemy, and probably more with some skill or luck roads. We'll give Keaton his first kill immediately. Laszlo provides a dual strike as Keaton takes his revenge against the archer. Laszlo is blocked off on all sides, so the Sky Knight won't be able to attack her. She will be forced to fight Keaton instead. Glory Hound! We've got this! Oh, can I help? Can we start now? Is it blood on me? Now that Perry has cleared the samurai, our objective is to have Niles kill the Hexing Rod Shrine Maiden. To do that, we also have to move some of the Sky Knights out of the way. Elise can start by lunging the ones who are paired up. That Sky Knight pair may end up either south or east of Elise, so the consistent way for Elise to do her job in both cases is to lunge from below the healthy Sky Knight using her hand axe. In this particular arrangement, that means Elise does not benefit from Benny's fierce Mian on this attempt, and she must hit. If the paired Sky Knights had been on Elise's south side, then the path would still be obstructed by the solo Sky Knight that Elise previously wounded. She is Odin's target. This attack is the reason that we removed Malefic Aura from Nyx. We want Odin to use Elise's dual strike, but with Malefic Aura, Odin would have been too powerful. Benny walks over to attack one of the archers. Elise doesn't always end up adjacent to this position, so for consistency's sake, he uses Niles' as tools for oh, Let me get a taste. By changing Perry's weapon to the Beast Killer, Felicia can defeat a third Sky Knight. With some help from Elise, Selina takes out the fourth one. Leo will transfer corn to Baruka, but first he grabs some extra weapons from the convoy. This Sky Knight can reach Keaton, Perry, Felicia, Odin, Selina, and Niles. Of those six units, four can kill on the counterattack. Keaton and Perry will do it in one hit with their effective weapons, Felicia can exploit Perry's dual strike, and with Elise backing her up, Selina simply has enough raw strength for the job. Lily's poise also just makes Selina immune. The two characters who can't kill with their counterattacks are Odin and Niles. Niles is particularly vulnerable since he's also facing two archers, but we can cover his flank using corn. How shall we proceed? Corn will attack the right-hand archer. 
On the following enemy phase, that archer would ordinarily see that Benny and Niles can kill him with their counterattacks, but Corrin cannot, and so he would choose to target Corrin. That would be very bad, because this archer has lunge. He would pull Corrin across the water to the stage, where the Oni savages might kill him. However, the left-hand archer goes first. Because the right-hand archer is in his way, he can only target Benny or Niles, not Corrin. Benny and Niles would both kill him, but the archer deals a lot more damage to Niles than to Benny, so Niles will be his target. He has 26 attack, and Niles has 10 defense, so he will deal 16 damage. That will drop Niles low enough for the second archer to see a kill, and so that archer will attack Niles instead of Corrin. Niles will have a full guard gauge, having taken a hit from the left-hand archer, and then counterattack twice. So Niles will actually be perfectly safe. He will kill both archers, and nobody will get lunged, as long as the first archer's attack hits, anyway. If not, this all goes horribly wrong. This is one example of a situation where if we had just given the Levin Sword to Corrin, there wouldn't be a problem. It's not your time. I guess that's it. I'm not looking for trouble, but I'm the one you want. Oh, that's it? <laughs> no mercy. <laughs> uh, amateur. I will protect you. The person we want to send onto the stage to fight the Oni Savages is Odin. His purpose is not to kill them, but rather to weaken them all for release, and we'll carry him over there. Felicia can take up Odin's former position to attack the Sky Knight, and we want her to use Leo's dual strike for that. Leo's accuracy isn't great, but we can improve it by moving Benny first. I'll help you. Whenever possible, we're trying to have Leo use swords. Sword rank isn't hugely important for him, given that swords and tomes occupy the same position in the weapon triangle, and the strength is nowhere near as good as his magic, but we'd like him to reach C rank at least. The Levin Sword is slightly stronger than Brynhild, and importantly for us, it can't crit. My aching blood! Baruka lunges the Oni Savage on the stage so that Nyx can kill him safely, without exposing herself to any throwing clubs. You'll be all right. Huh? Not a chance. Huh? Are you okay? Uh Such a tease. This should be quick. With age comes wisdom. Appearances can be deceiving. The two healthy Oni Savages should attack Odin because they'll deal more damage to him than to Baruka, but the injured one will attack Baruka because she can't kill him, and Odin can't. Given the choice between Selena's support or Felicia's, Perry chooses Selena's to make sure the support point count works out right. Oh, no! Yay, violence! With that done, Selena can fly south to meet up with Laszlo. She kills an archer along the way. The best. I 
won't let you down. Levin Sword Laszlo allows us to farm some extra axe experience for Selena. Try to pull your weight. I will protect you. Baruka now exchanges Corin for Niles. Niles gives her a total of 9 movement, which is enough to fly all the way to the treasure chest on the stage. Elise moves down next to Baruka to get 4 extra points of hit while she kills the most dangerous Oni Savage, the one who has a steel club. She uses her hand axe for this instead of her bronze axe because there's still another Oni Savage with a throwing club. Selena has been frozen, but she can work around that by pairing up with Laszlo. One of the weaker aspects of this map's design is that the Enfeeble and Freeze ranges extend way beyond the reinforcement trigger. There's nothing stopping you from standing around for several turns to waste all the staff uses, and then waiting even longer for Enfeeble to wear off before you proceed. We're doing a little bit of that, but it's mostly incidental. We're not going to drain every charge from the enemy stage before we start making progress, we just want them to run out by the time we're mopping up. Let's share this one. Remain calm. What are you waiting for? It's all right. Once Elise takes out the throwing club Oni Savage, Niles will be able to safely open the chest. So exciting. Must I restrain myself? We are about to summon the reinforcements, and we'd like to bring Niles back as soon as possible so we can use them against the Kenshi Knights. Paired with Baruka, he has 7 movement, which is enough to reach the sea tiles below the stage. If we put Selena on one of those tiles, then Baruka can transfer Niles to her, and Selena can carry him away. The Oni Savage will still target Elise because Selena has a higher defense stat. Um, shall we? Let's leave no survivors. Leo will engage the closest archer. I pointed out in his introduction that he can one-shot the archers with Brynhilde, but the catch is that one of the Shrine Maidens will try to enfeeble him. If he does get enfeebled, then he'll have to rely on Felicia's dual strike to get the kill. Because I'm looking for consistency, I'm making Leo equip Fimblefetter instead. That way, he always uses Felicia's dual strike. Given that a lot of other things have to go right for this whole strategy to work, and that Felicia's facing weapon triangle disadvantage against the archer, I would prefer not to use Felicia's dual strike at all. 
I'd rather take the one-shot kill with Brynhildr and be done with it. But when I recorded this, I didn't have a way to make the Enfeebled Maiden target anyone else. After the fact, I did eventually find a solution. Leo is not the only unit who will be in range of the enemies on this turn. Keaton will fight an Oni Savage on the south side. Because Keaton has already been Enfeebled, the AI won't do it again, so Leo is the only valid target. But if we put Selina in range on the previous turn, she would have been targeted instead of Keaton because her Staff Avoid is worse. Keaton would then remain available as a second target, and Leo would never get Enfeebled. I want to see what happens. I'll do my best. Time for some killing. <laughs> my aching blood! Not bad! Not bad! So, long story short, Felicia's 6.55% failure rate with this dual strike could have been eliminated with slightly better tactics. That's not a huge chance, but it compounds on all the other failure states that this strategy has. We haven't yet seen the worst of those. The reinforcements consist of three Sky Knights with Darting Blow, each paired up with a Kinchi Knight. Neither half of the pair is especially strong. The generic Kinchi Knights are pale imitations of Reyna. But both sides are quite fast, and that can make them dangerous. Our plan is to take on all three pairs of enemies simultaneously using three separate units. One of those is Niles, who is about to go for a ride. I'll support you. Niles uses a Vulnerary so that he can survive the middle Kenshi Knight. The bottommost Kenshi Knight will be Perry's responsibility. This is a pretty awkward matchup, even with help from Benny and his personal skill. Perry would rather use a Kodachi than a Javelin if she's going to counterattack a bow user, but then the Sky Knight would attack her instead of the Kenshi Knight, and it's the Kenshi Knight that we want to kill. Benny is in range of the middle Kenshi Knight just like Niles, but he takes no damage from them. Leo will fight the northernmost Kenshi Knight. Down south, Laszlo and Keaton will begin to retreat. Their task is to keep fighting the Oni Savages, and also to attract one of the two remaining archers. This is another instance where Laszlo can exploit the Levin Sword. It doesn't kill the wounded Oni Savage in its first hit, so if Laszlo equips it and he ends up next to Selina, she'll be able to swing her axe one more time. The hope is that this bottom archer will go northwest toward Odin, while the top one will go southwest toward Keaton, and then all three Sky Knights will simply fly west as far as they can. That's what usually happens, roughly 70% of the time in my experiments, but this can certainly go wrong. Both archers might go northwest, or one of them might head due north toward the stage to reach Baruka.
63% is so rough. Parry's counterattack doesn't have to hit, but if not, our backup options are about as bad. The archers all behaved, but we're not out of the woods yet, because we have a bunch of flyers on our hands. Just like in Chapter 13, we can't control everything they do, but at least we can take out all the Kenshinites. No mercy. This is one of the times when, to make up for Niles hogging the boss experience, Elise has to attack some less than ideal targets. We're making the best we can of a bad job. We've managed to boost her listed accuracy to 88%, which is relatively respectable. wants not just one Kenshi Knight kill, but two. We don't have Azura, but we do have Shelter. Before Perry can provide that, we need to address the southernmost Kenshi Knight. Benny moves away to open up space next to Perry, then weakens the enemy with the most accurate weapon he has. If Perry had missed, he would have to use his Steel Lance plus one instead. Continuing with the theme of feeding the highest value enemies to our fledgling flyers, right, Selina takes this kill using Perry support. Before sheltering Elise, Perry equips the Brass Naginata. The point of that is to maximize her defense stat to discourage the Sky Knights from attacking her. Once Elise has been sheltered, Corrin takes her and switches, and Elise lunges the final Kenji Knight for her second kill. Heartseeker does wonders here. We've got this! The chosen hero arrives! Odin will weaken this Sky Knight with help from Niles. The idea is that he will then be able to kill the Sky Knight on enemy phase using Leo's dual strike. Let's kill him hell. Let's do this together. Now we're down to five Sky Knights. This one is almost trapped by Odin, Elise, and Perry. As long as we move Niles out of range, she should attack Odin and die. Then the other Sky Knight on the west side, the one by Selina and Benny, will take her place, attacking Odin again. That's all fine. The problem is on the east side. After Keaton and Laszlo move, those three Sky Knights will be totally free. However, we can lock down two of them by leaving Niles in range. The middle Sky Knight will be forced toward Niles to dual strike for the uppermost one. That leaves just one Sky Knight unaccounted for, the one with the Bolt Naginata. There's nothing we can do about her. Laszlo and Keaton are the only resources we have left, and they can't survive her attacks. They just have to run away. We need her to go west-northwest, finishing her turn on or adjacent to the two boats in the center of the map. Once again, there's about a 30% chance of failure. She may go too far west or too far north. We also need to lure this Oni Savage to the southwest, and if he's on Keaton's right side, he may not cooperate. We got lucky and he attacked from below. Keaton can distract him easily by standing at the end of his range with no weapons equipped. Most of these problems stem from a rule change I made for this run. I added a new goal, unlocking all of Korin's friendship classes. To achieve that, we want Korin to obtain A support with Ben. That process hasn't even started, but somehow the two of them need to lead this map with a C support unlocked despite the fact that most of the combat is already over. So we need to engineer a situation where Corrin and Benny can do several rounds of combat together against a shrinking population of enemies. At the same time, we still have all our other support goals to manage, and we still want to feed Elise, Selina, and Odin as much experience as we possibly can. You, uh, passed your test. No mercy. Ah! Yeah, 
On this attempt, everything has worked out. For enemy movements, we basically just won a raw 50-50. We've hit a bunch of attacks with 80-something percent listed hit rates. We got through everything involving Benny, Perry, Selena, and that Southern Kenshi Knight. And Nyx and Elise pulled through on turn one. We are almost home free. Almost. All right, come on. No! Don't start without me. Uh, nicely done. <laughs> The way that Benny and Korn will get their support points is by holding a choke point against the two surviving Oni Savages on the southern oh, side of the map. Please. To set that up, we need to clear out the Sky Knights, and then Felicia needs to carry Korin down south. Meanwhile, Niles must deal with this archer. He's better off letting the archer attack first. I'll help you. I'll do what no one else can. I'll kill you. Let's end this here. Can we start now? Selena and Elise can both get experience from this kill after Selena changes Elise's weapon. Elise has 25 attack using the hand axe. Her forged steel axe has 7 more might, which would give her a total of 32. The Sky Knight has 10 defense, so Elise will deal 11 damage. Selena was swinging for 18, and 18 plus 11 is 3 points over the kill threshold. That means Selena can afford to swap bronze axes with Elise, taking the weaker, unforged one. That'll be advantageous in the future because if Selena deals less damage, then she can perform more dual strikes. We have just a couple more 80-ish percent axe attacks to get through. In case of emergency, this one at least has backups. Let's win this one, all right? Ah! Waste of time. That was my job. We didn't miss, so Baruka can proceed with an attack on the last Sky Knight. Her job is to weaken the enemy, so she's better off going for the 99% hand axe hit rather than risking a 1% crit with the iron axe. Uh, Odin takes the kill. He uses Perry's dual strike. If he had to, he could make her equip the beast killer. If Korin occupies this one tile bridge and he drops Felicia to the north, then the archer will go first and he will attack Felicia. By so doing, he will body block both Oni savages, who will be stuck standing around doing nothing. This will be a challenge.
This should be quick. Nyx can guarantee this kill for Niles, who could go ahead and capture the archer. After all, why not? Keep your eyes on me. Stop. How disappointing. Let's do this. We won't give up. Uh-oh. What now? This is our last seriously risky move, I promise. And hey, even if he least misses, she won't die. Can you believe that? This is my chance! Whoa, thanks! I'll do my best. Good luck. Corin finally acquires Benny. He and Benny want to deal as little damage as possible, so Benny equips the Brass Knight Nelka. To reduce Corin's damage, we should give him the weakest possible sword. No. Baruka does not want to be frozen again, so she takes Keaton and switches to him, then Keaton drops her outside of staff range. Such are the whims of Felicia and Perry can earn some of their support points just from healing, and once Felicia has moved, Perry can deliver her bronze sword to Corin. Ready to go. Go. Go, go. Selena and Laszlo arrange themselves for some more Leaven Sword plus Bronze Axe action on the Shrine Maidens. We've got this. Let me try. We won't give up. This is my chance. <laughs> Great job, Benny. I'd be chuckling too. Hey! Don't forget about me! This will be a challenge. I'll protect you. I can help you! For Corrin and Benny to have a fourth battle together, Corrin must reacquire a ranged weapon. Elise serves as the delivery girl and she can continue building her own support with Corrin in the process. I'm with you. Ready for this? I'll do my best. <sighs> You'll be all right. Can I go first? What follows is a bunch of fancy maneuvering to help us clear out the Shrine Maidens and set up for our date with Kumagera. Uh, my aching blood! You're hopeless without me. All right! What are you waiting for? Niles can take the forged bronze bow from Laszlo. Oh, All Laszlo needs for his duties is the Leaven Sword. I'll be strong for you. Can we start now? <laughs> go, go! Laszlo is not the only one who can hit highly resistant enemies with weak magical attacks. Sandbagging has its limit, and that limit depends on how annoying the enemies are. The Freeze Maiden is very annoying. Your turn, child. That was good for me.
Don't worry. We'll be okay, right? Must I restrain myself? All right, let's go! Because Perry sheltered him and then Odin took and dropped him, Benny is close enough to assist Korn in one final battle, while still being able to heal using the Blessed Lift. This is a good challenge. That went well. Let's go. Let's make this fun. One support goal we've missed is between Laszlo and Odin. They're looking to earn one point, building on the sea support they got when Laszlo joined in Chapter 12. Together. The darkness whispers. I will protect you. Now, it's not over yet. Let's share this one. I want to see what happens. Such are the whims of fate! We're not alone. So excited! Ha, that was you! Ah! Perry is trying to achieve a C rank in swords, so she's better off using the Kodachi than the Javelin, all else being equal. She wants that C rank partly for the actual damage and accuracy benefits, but let's be honest, it's mainly so she can do the same Levin Sword shenanigans as Laszlo. To get their sea support with each other, Leo and Odin must work together one more time. I'll fight too. My darkness was darker than yours! Admit it, you need me. Um, shall we? Are you scared? Benny and Baruka will be part of the team that engages Kumagera's squad first. The other part will be Odin and Elise. Hey, don't forget about me. This archer will only attack you if you're inside in trap range, so despite appearances, Elise is safe at the far south end of his range. Let's do this! Come on, smile! Lazlo uses his rally to increase Odin's speed by one. In this instance, Odin's already fast enough, and this doesn't matter, but sometimes it saves him from getting doubled by Kumagera. Remember, Kumagera has Darting Blow, so he's significantly faster on enemy fight. Such a nuisance. Corrin and Niles carry Leo and Selina closer to the boss. Such a tease. Let's go! My power is at your service. I think we can win. Baruka goes in first, attacking the Shrine Maiden. This really doesn't make a lot of sense, given that the two archers could certainly kill her if they tried, but it seems like they strongly prefer to stick with Kumagera. Their loss, I guess. Kumagera goes first. Now Odin has 12 HP, and Kumagera's dual strike is apparently worth 7 damage, so the healthy archer sees a kill. And that explains why this archer would attack Odin, but afterward, Odin heals himself out of apparent kill range. Why doesn't the northern archer then try to kill Baruka using the southern archer's dual strike? I don't know. 
Power overflowing! Here I am. The rest of the team now closes in. While they catch up, we can continue Elise's training program. She may not get to kill Kumagera, but she can at least fight him. And Leo can help her finish off the final archer. What are you waiting for? The darkness whispers. Such are the whims of fate. That was too easy. Benny keeps on hitting. We're saving the Shrine Maiden for Perry, who needs a couple more support points with Selena and Felicia. Perry gives the Kodachi back to Korin so that he can have one more round of combat using Elise's support. Ready for this? Let's do this! We've got this. Korin survives this, but if he did need some help, we could reposition Felicia to cover him with Demo Cell. Um, shall we? Let's win this one, alright? Ready for this? Imagine dying to the 2% crit. Leo joins up with Niles. That's not just to clear space. We'd like Leo and Niles to earn one support point from this mission, and for that, they need a little bit more than one round of combat together. Check out my skills! Leo's attacking purely for the support points, not the experience, so he's happy to deal zero damage. Let's go for this. <laughs> Benny hits Kumagera one last time, and then he'll be ready for capture. Come on, smile for me. If you die on me, I'll kill you. You're hopeless without me. <laughs> Finally, we can breathe easy. This was by far the least consistent strategy I've used, and it was very frustrating to record. 
I hope the results end up being worth the effort. We'll find out, but the era of erratic flyer movement is still not over. <sighs> yes. Hmm. Hmm. Father? What? This ends now! Insolent fool! <laughs> what was that? Ah! Enough. Um, yes. Do not. Fail me. <sighs> no. Hush. <sighs> Rio. No. <sighs> yes. Yes.
Brother. Huh? Know this. It can't be. I see. Yeah. Next time, Corrin undergoes his training arc so he can be a certified good unit again. But he's not the only one who's about to get some major training. See you there.